the reason I do speak a lot on population is, first of all, I like to think as an economist, I'm persuaded that reproductive behavior can be analyzed and understood in the same way as consumption behavior is, or dress behavior and so forth. And that the idea that when it comes to consumption, Tradition doesn't matter, but when it comes to reproduction, tradition matters and overrides it, and therefore you say it can't be discussed. That seems to me to be completely at variance with the data that I have, the evidence that I've acquired. So I give it a little more time to talking about it as a reaction to the fact that nobody wants to talk about it. Those insightful words are from Sir Partha Dasgupta, a world-renowned economist who is challenging the infinite economic growth model and putting economics in its rightful place as a subset of nature and all life on Earth. We'll get to hear more from him on this episode of the Overpopulation Podcast. Welcome to the Overpopulation Podcast, where we tirelessly make overshoot and overpopulation common knowledge. That's the first step in right-sizing the scale of our human footprint so that it is in balance with life on Earth, enabling all species to thrive. I'm Nandita Bajaj, co-host and executive director of Population Balance. And I'm Alan Ware, co-host of the podcast and researcher with Population Balance, a nonprofit organization that works hard to educate and raise awareness about the impacts of human overpopulation and overconsumption on the planet, people, and animals. We are proud to be the first and only organization globally that draws the connections between pronatalism, anthropocentrism, and overpopulation, and their combined devastating impacts on social, reproductive, ecological, and intergenerational justice. And before we move on to today's guest, we've got some listener feedback from Dennis in South Africa. He says, I have belatedly listened to episode 80, Bill Ryerson's Soap Operas for Social Justice. I have generally had a contemptuous attitude to soap operas and the viewers. Most soap operas are superficial, promote ostentatious and consumerist lifestyles, and have a negative effect on society. But Bill's strategy of turning them to good use has given me a new perspective regarding the potential good in this market. His strategy seems to have had enormous effect, and he is targeting and influencing people who otherwise would not be interested in or even resistant to topics such as family planning. Thanks again for your good work. Well, thank you for the wonderful feedback, Dennis. We agree that PMC's unique strategy has the potential to create massive positive shifts in cultural norms as they have already shown in the countries they've worked in. If you have feedback or guest recommendations, you can email us at podcast at populationbalance.org. And thanks to all of our wonderful listeners, we are excited to announce that we now rank in the top 2% of all of the podcasts globally. In addition to this podcast, we also run educational programs around ecological overshoot, pronatalism, and animal rights. We go into schools and conferences and talk to young people with the goal of empowering them to make liberated and responsible reproductive and consumptive choices. And we do all of this with a really small staff and a tiny budget. And we count on you to keep doing this important work. Just a small donation goes a long way to keep our podcast on the air and to keep us expanding our outreach programs. Please support our work by clicking on the donate button in our show notes and to learn about the different ways you can give, which include one-time or monthly donations, as well as legacy gifts. Yes, legacy gifts are a really great way to support us. You can give to Population Balance through your will or trust, or by naming Population Balance as a beneficiary of your life insurance policy, retirement plan, or royalties. You can learn more about this on our website, populationbalance.org. And now on to today's guest, Sir Partha Dasgupta, whose bio easily spans across two pages, and for the sake of brevity, we're only highlighting some of his accomplishments. You can see the full bio link in our show notes. Sir Partha Dasgupta is Emeritus Professor of Economics at the University of Cambridge, Fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge, and Professorial Research Fellow at the Sustainable Consumption Institute, University of Manchester. He has also taught at the London School of Economics and Stanford University. In 1996, he helped to establish the journal Environment and Development Economics, whose purpose has been not only to publish original research at the interface of poverty, 
and the environmental resource base, but also to provide an opportunity to scholars in developing countries to publish their findings in an international journal. Dasgupta was named Knight Bachelor by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in 2002 for services to economics. Dasgupta's research interests have covered welfare and development economics, the economics of technological change, population, environmental, and resource economics, the theory of games, the economics of undernutrition, and the economics of social capital. His publications include over a dozen articles and several books, including Time and the Generations, Population Ethics for a Diminishing Planet in 2019, and the Economics of Biodiversity, the Dasgupta Review from 2021, a 600-page study that was commissioned by the UK government and examines the economic benefits of biodiversity and the cost of losing it. Professor Sir Partha, it is such an honor to be with you today. It's a rare privilege to have someone with your distinguished accomplishments and also someone in the field of economics who cares so deeply about both social and ecological justice. A pleasure to be with you. So we'll start with our first question, which is, you are one of the relatively few economists who are promoting a greater understanding in the field of economics and the world at large that the economy is a subset of nature and that we must conserve and protect nature if we hope to have a sustainable human future. You mention three categories of ecosystem services that contribute directly or indirectly to human well-being. Could you start by giving us an overview of these categories? Yes, of course. These categories were not my creation. It was the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment of 2005, which started this classification scheme. So the three that I pointed out to are, first of all, provisioning goods, and they include food, water, timber, fibers, pharmaceuticals. In other words, bear in mind, these are the goods which with human labor and ingenuity, produce the final outputs which are measured by GDP. So these are provisioning goods. This distinction is really critical, so that's one. And the second, these are services that Mother Nature provides, and they are often invisible and also silent. So think of what's going on under your feet, in the soils or in the deep oceans. They're called maintenance and regulating services. So that would be carbon capture, decomposition of waste. That's extremely important, we forget. All the stuff that we throw out eventually gets recycled. Pollination, circulation of the oceans, leading to a transfer of nutrients, and so forth. These are absolutely fundamental in the sense that without them, we would have no provisioning goods. And the third is, I've been not taking too much notice of it because they're quite obvious, which are cultural services, Mm -hmm. uh, leisure activities, for example, enabling social capital to be created and to flourish. But it's the first two that I want to concentrate on because the third is really rather obvious. It'll be part of the, if you like, the use value of nature. Mm -hmm. First is basic needs, but the second, maintenance and regulation, are like basic industries. Without them, nothing will happen. And if you disturb that and destroy it, we as a species will be out. Mm -hmm. I suppose I think I ought to make mention one further thing about this two-way distinction between provisioning goods and maintenance and regulating services, because uh, they're at the heart of much of the controversy between economists and ecologists. Economists essentially spent much of their time when discussing resources of the environment on the first provisioning goods and also the cultural services, so that nature is an amenity. A good example will be climate change economics, concentrated entirely on finding ways to substitute one pattern of energy production by another. So moving away from fossil fuels to clean energy production. And that's very subtle because it's saying that you can substitute your way out of environmental problems by finding new ways of producing provisioning goods. Right. The substitution possibilities is at the heart of much of the discussion in economics. And it suggests that you can have GDP growth by investing in ways of substituting one kind of resource for another or one pattern of doing things for another. Now, maintenance and regulating services, in contrast, are on the whole complementary to one another. So suppose, for example, you mess around with the climate system, too much carbon in the atmosphere is going to affect and be affected by the rainforests Mm -hmm. and circulation patterns. So it's not quite like a house of cards 
Nature is not a house of cards. She's resilient. But of course, we are now so powerful that we can turn it into a house of cards if we want. Right. So my review is really about the maintenance and regulating services, not mm-hmm. about provisioning goods. Those would be elements that can't be easily substituted by price signals and market mechanisms. Well, it can't be substituted, that's for sure, because they are complementary. These are processes that have evolved over 4.3 billion years. But the substitution occurs at the provisioning goods side of things. But of course, they are being produced with the help of this undercurrent of maintenance and regulation. Well, this kind of gets to the idea of asset. You've emphasized in your writings the critical difference between income and wealth. And as you've made clear, the standard measure of a nation's income or gross domestic product is a measure of the flow of provisioning services and tells us nothing about the destruction of the nation's natural wealth that helped make that income possible. And you've emphasized that human well-being now and in the future derives from the total wealth or what you're calling the inclusive wealth. What do you mean by that term, inclusive wealth? How would a measure of inclusive wealth differ from how we're measuring wealth today? Well, you're asking two questions, and both are very good. So let me try out the first one, the distinction between income and wealth. Then we can talk about different ways of thinking about wealth. There are two problems with GDP, growth, domestic product. One is that it's a flow, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But the critical weakness of it is that it's gross. The rogue word is gross. Gross means, I don't mean ugly, in the sense that it doesn't take into account the depreciation of assets that accompanies the production of goods and services. So think of a household which, and you ask them, you know, what is their wealth in a household? And they will have a reasonable answer to it. They'll talk about the house they own, the property they own, and the shares they have, and so forth, and probably expressed in dollar values. They'll include their graduating son or daughter, because he or she will have a flow of income in the past. And so there is human capital embodied in them, and so forth. So something like a wealth is Now, suppose the household consumes in excess of the income that is generated by that wealth. Then what will happen is that the wealth will start declining. That's what you mean by saying the person is living or household is living beyond its means. At some stage, something will give. It'll go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. I can't borrow (laughs) indefinite. That's the idea. Okay. So GDP has this singular weakness in not measuring, taking note of the fact of what's happening to the biosphere or the natural wealth that the economy has access to, okay? If it depreciates, it degrades, it's not recorded in GDP because you're looking at only final output. Right. So that's one weakness, and that's a major weakness. So you might say, well, why not measure the depreciation and deduct it and call it net domestic product? That's not a bad idea. That's the first move. But then, of course, you could consume even more than your net domestic product, and if you do, then your wealth will go down. So you need two changes to be made on gross domestic product. First of all, take into account the depreciation of capital. But the reason we have to emphasize depreciation is because we're looking at Mother Nature, and she's extremely easy to depreciate, right. as we know from experience. Okay, look at the carbon we emit, which leads to the depreciation of the atmosphere and the biosphere in its capacity to re- recycle. Mm-hmm. That's what the problem is, right? We're messing around with a major maintenance and regulating service, which is climate regulation. And that unravels many other processes because it acidifies the oceans, for example. So that changes many of the ocean's characteristics and thereby the services the oceans are providing and so forth and so on. I mean, the chain reactions are just enormous. Okay, so that's why suddenly depreciation becomes important. If you didn't take nature into account, just imagine there was no nature. It's the mythical world that only the physical capital produced capital, roads and buildings and human capital. You might say, well, look, there is depreciation there as well, because after all, buildings depreciate, roads depreciate. But those are manageable ones. You can observe it. And firms actually have depreciation allowances. So they take that depreciation into account because nothing unto it can happen. You know something about the structure of these objects. Maybe there'll be a 3% depreciation each year, in which case you keep 3% aside for repairs and maintenance. Nature is very different. 
mostly it's not priced, to come back to a point that you made earlier, Alan. And one reason it's not priced is property rights are very hard to define on an object which is very often invisible, it's silent, and it's mobile. Mobility, of course, makes it extremely difficult to create private property. We have a problem here because we have an asset, a great chunk of which is unpriced. When we make use of it, we have no incentive to either measure it, because what does it mean to measure it since it's unpriced? It's here today, gone tomorrow. So I may as well use it as much as I can. So we excessively depend on Mother Nature. We allow her to depreciate. And that depreciation is not picked up in the economic statistics. And we need to do that. I've heard you mention a 2018 UN-sponsored study that looked at the depreciation per person of natural capital estimated at 40% since 1992, and a uh, increase in produced capital, the roads and buildings and cars, of 100% since 1992. How confident are you in that measure of the decrease well, in natural the, capital? That's exactly the right kind of study to make, but that 40% decline is an extreme underestimate because they could only measure those for which they could put some prices. Oh, right. So there is a lot more that's been damaged without there. Wow. And there's no need for apology for any economist who does this kind of uh, work to say that it's inaccurate. We're just beginning to do this kind of work and the authors deserve all the praise that I've actually given them because without that kind of number, I'm a theorist. I tend to arrive at conclusions on the basis of analytical reasoning. That's fine because it's theorizing which enables applied people to know what to apply ideas to. Without that, you're just randomly looking at the world. But you do need numbers. Without that, there is something dry and bloodless in pure theory. So I've I've really been very keen on encouraging my applied colleagues to try and do, no matter how dirty the applied work is, (laughs) By definition, it's going to be dirty, but this one is really dirty because there's no history on which they can depend. I mean, if you're estimating GDP, you've got about 70 years of trial each year. Millions and millions of dollars have been spent in refining ways of estimating it by different countries, different sectors, and so forth. So, And even then, so many things get missed in GDP. Yeah, measuring soil quality and water quality and peatlands and coral reefs. And- it's very hard, but they've done it. They've done tried hard right. and done usually on those that they can get some notion of nominal prices. And, and we need right. so much more of it we- right, to be measuring it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And how do you think capitalism, as it's currently practiced, should be changed in light of this idea of natural and inclusive wealth? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I should say one thing. I've never in my writings attacked capitalism, because if I do that, I'll have to attack pretty much everything else that's going. I mean, the communist regime seems to be horrible. I mean, what the Soviet Union did to natural capital is beneath contempt. Okay, right. so this is not any particular system. I may dislike one more than the other, but on this plane of this stuff, uh, they're all pretty nasty. And it's nasty because we don't have the incentive. It's more to do with the human nature. In the modern world, we have moved more and more away from nature, which has made it even less possible to provide the incentives people need in order to be able to place some price to these. Now, let me try and explain what I mean. Suppose you go to a coastal fishery in, say, Tanzania, and I'm giving you that example because I was there some 20 years ago in that village on the coast in Zanzibar, and I saw the local, not even villages, these are hamlets, actually. They come out in the low tide with the harpoons and fish. Now, such people, most valuable asset is the fishery, is the coast. The coastal forest is extremely important. That's where they live. But I'm now talking about the, what they're doing the, on the oceans. And they husband it. And how do they husband it? They don't actually put a price on the fish. Of course not. So I discussed it. Said, how, what, what, what's going on? How do you handle it? They said, well, they have norms of behavior that have been built up over centuries, maybe thousands of years, which is, you know, fish so much, not from this part of the coast at this time of the day, this time of the month. They know something about spawning times. They know something about the growth process of fishery. So they're husbanding collectively through, not through a price system. Although, by the way, anthropologists have found many cases where a price system is used. In the case of, in South India, water regulation within villages. Mm-hmm. Those are allocation of water is based on a price system in the following sense that you are fined if you take more than you are. Right. Your share. right. Okay. 
So it's not as though they aren't price system, but they're ways of managing a resource where there's an implicit price system. And that's, of course, for a very industrial economy, large scale economy, the world economy, that's not going to happen. I mean, these community based rules and regulations uh, for managing the local ecosystems is a very different problem than for a global economy or a national economy. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the institutional structure. Never mind whether it's the law or whether the norms, that we just don't have that. We haven't created it to manage our most important asset ourselves, if you like. And we are part of that. That's nature. We managed it over things we produce, over provisioning goods. Obviously, the desk I am sitting at is my desk. And if somebody tries to take it away, I can call the police and so forth. There is a structure, uh, institutional structure, which provides me with the incentives to manage this desk, not mismanage it, so to speak. Right. And I don't have that with so much of nature. Yeah, I'm not suggesting it's easy, but we haven't even tried to see how to manage this intricate, interconnected set of assets. You've done work on the common property resources yeah. of like that fishing village where indigenous, small scale, local people have yeah. found ways to manage their commons effectively where the market and the state have less of a role. Yeah. And I think you've heard a lot of times we should just leave things alone, either let nature alone to be able to rehabilitate, replenish its regulatory and maintenance services, or leave small communities alone, let, have the state yeah. let them That's alone right. because they've figured things out of how to manage resources cooperatively. So that is something we can learn from indigenous people. But like you say, with things like the atmosphere, these larger elements that do have more of a tragedy of the commons. That's exactly right. Consider the open oceans beyond the 200 mile. Yes. Uh, in, in EZ. The oceans are significant and they're a huge global public good. And it's a public good because it's mobile circulation pattern. Everybody's affected in different ways, but we are all affected by the oceans. And yet, of course, it's a open access resource. So uh, we don't have to go very far deep into economic theory. The tragedy of the commons stares at us the face. Uh, and yet we have no institutional mechanism to date to regulate the use of the nation oceans. And by the use, I mean, of course, the trillions of dollars of merchandise that is shipped across the oceans, all the stuff, you know, these container ships. And on top of that, there is deep sea fishing, which is destroying the oceans. Notice nobody's charged for the use of the ocean. Beyond right. That. You're not paying for it. Now, that's one of the aspects of the fact that it's a open access resource. And we should be doing that. We don't have an institution to be able to regulate the use of the ocean, mm -hmm. all the discharge of waste. Now, I'm not suggesting it's easy. The waste disposal is hard because it's coming from all parts of the uh, coast of the oceans, goes out saying. But surely the traffic is monitored. We don't do anything about that. So that's one class of problems arising out of the fact that we have these global public goods, which are have to be natural capital, and yet we don't have an institution to limit our use of it. We have no incentive to practice restraint. A second class is these tropical rainforests. They're also global public goods for reasons we all understand now. They're the seat of 50% of biodiversity, if nothing else, and plus on top of the God knows how many things they're doing for us. But they are not open access resources, at least not globally, because they're within national jurisdiction, Brazilian, Colombian, Congo, and so forth. So we have a problem there because you have the nations claiming that this their property and the old-fashioned way they treat these assets uh, on the basis of their notion of what their people need. And there is truth in that. There is truth in the fact that the individual country which houses a great deal of rainforest is small relative to the global economy. So they could say, well, why are we small economy responsible for the whole world? If you don't like us deforesting, why don't you compensate us right. for not deforesting? So that's called payment for ecosystem services, which is a practice which is becoming more and more common within nations, within countries, like the government subsidizing farmers to replant and so forth. Okay, That's becoming now more and more common. Even private individuals compensating one another for services that their natural capital is offering the other. So again, this would be one where the global community should be negotiating through the UN, maybe, with individual countries, say Brazil, saying you're transforming the Amazon into plantations and cattle ranches. And so let's negotiate. You say that you need this because you're exporting the beef to us, after all. At the end of the day, a lot of us is being consumed by us. So there's this entire class of issues which are crying out for an institutional solution. 
and Alan was suggesting that we should fill these holes. So I wanted to give you this example. The suggestion that I made in my review, and I've been writing quite a lot on it, is not anything new, but I'm just repeating myself. But I'm told that you have to keep on repeating if you have to be listening to, <laughs> is that we really need a new institution, like the institutions that were created after the Second World War, to fill up gaps in the institutions that would supply global public goods, the World Bank, IMF, ILO, the whole lot of these UN institutions are supplying public goods. Why did we do that? We needed institutions like that. So we need one like that for these. And if you collect the revenue, if you start charging for the use of the oceans, you could collect billions each year, literally billions. I mean, very there are trillions of dollars of merchandise being so. Yeah. So you could use some of that for paying countries to protect their rainforest. Of course, there'll be hard bargaining involved, you know, all that mess will be there. But not to think about it seems to me to be really irresponsible. And as I've heard you mention, IMF, World Bank, that whole apparatus was put in place in post-World War II for war-ravaged yeah. economies yeah. for growth, for building developed societies and getting people out of poverty. And now, as the great acceleration has proceeded and we see all the ecological crises coming, we need a new international structure like you've talked so. about. And it does seem like... Much to it. It's not it's, right. it's big outliers like ourselves who are doing this. And we really need heavy hitters, I guess, in the international arena. And I'm surprised that leaders of the United Nations aren't broaching these issues. And, you know, you've noted appropriately that the demand that we're making on nature currently exceeds by about 70 percent its ability to provide all of its gifts and services to us on a sustainable basis. And on that front, you have very openly talk about limits to growth, both in terms of consumption and how quickly we are turning nature into capital. You've also talked about limiting the human numbers or human population. And you've estimated that Earth might be able to sustainably support a population of, of about 3.3 billion people living at about 20,000 US dollars per person per year. And that's far below the 8 billion people we have now with a per capita consumption of about 17,000 US dollars per person per year. But of course, that's not equally distributed across the globe. Can you briefly explain how you came up with those figures and, and then you know what kind of response have you had to that proposal? All right. Well, let me take steps to why I've been so involved in thinking about population. It goes back to my graduate student days. See, one of the problems we social scientists have is that we are extremely prone to political correctness. Right. Uh, we feel some things can't be discussed because people feel offended. I come from India, from a part of the Indian culture, which didn't feel there is a limit to what you can discuss. There is a Brahminic <laughs> tradition, which is of that sort. Right. There is there are traditions in every culture with that sort. I think my Jewish friends are known to be pretty much willing to discuss anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so what's that got to do with population? Well, the point that you are making that the total demand we are making on Mother Nature's maintenance and regulating services, because I think that's the way to think about it. Mm -hmm. But of course, it manifests itself in the demand we make on provisioning goods, because sure. that's what we are, food, water, timber, and so forth, okay? Mm -hmm. And we transform the landscape in order to be able to generate those goods. And in the process of doing that, we are perturbing in a big way maintenance and regulating services. So the idea is to ask, what is the total demand we make on these services? And then compare it with nature's ability to supply them on a sustainable basis. Right. Because, of course, you can demand more than she can supply, and we're doing that. But you can do that by nature becoming weaker and weaker. Mm -hmm. It's becoming unhealthier, degrading more. Okay. So the 70% excess is an estimate coming from a group of scholars who have been working on this field for quite some time. They call it the ecological footprint, and that's about 1.7. Now, that too is an underestimate for the same reason, as I suggested earlier, it's a widely 40% reduction in per capita natural capital globally over a 20-year period was an underestimate. Sure. But that, never mind. It's to give you a sense of how much there's an imbalance. Now, then the natural question is, what are the factors giving rise to the demand? Mm -hmm. Well, the natural thing to do is to say, well, it's our activity. So then you ask, what are human activities? How do you measure it? So what I did was to say, well, it's, in fact, I borrowed an idea from Paul Ehrlich, Anne Ehrlich, and 
John Holdren in a paper in 1971. There's a great paper, by the way. I mean, I've given them a huge amount of publicity, but it's, I keep on teasing them that they should have contacted me so that they could have made the paper more, if you like, structured. So what is this activity? So the simple way of measuring activity would be to say GDP. Mm -hmm. And then GDP, of course, would be an underestimate of activity because there are many activities which are not priced. And so that's the first cut. But we have data on GDP. And GDP is topologically total numbers multiplied by per capita GDP. That's a tautology. Okay? Right. So you have now two factors. The reason you want to do it in this form is that you can say, well, there's obviously a trade-off between numbers and standard of living. Mm -hmm. If you want to measure the standard of living in terms of GDP. But now you need also a way of translating GDPs, of course, activities, but the activities are using up other nature services. So you need a efficiency parameters. How efficient are we in transforming Mother Nature services into final output? Now you have three factors. Mm -hmm. Population, standard of living, and the way in which we transform. Right. Now the economics of climate change has only looked at that efficiency parameter. The presumption is that you can keep on increasing per capita GDP, never mind what the human numbers are. What you can do is to become more and more efficient in using Mother Nature stuff. And you can, life will be fine. Clean energy is the example. Mm -hmm. You move more and more away from polluting production processes to unpolluting ones. And unpolluting here is defined exclusively in terms of whether it's carbon emitting. Right. Energy. So, yeah. Now, I'm giving that as an example, not because I want to criticize the economics of climate change, but it gives me a nice platform to explain why that's wrong. Because when it comes to these maintenance and regulating services, climate change is only one such service. And all the others are these complementary ones, which we're ignoring, one of them being decomposition of waste. Right. And there, you can't have 100% efficiency by definition of decomposition of waste, because 100% efficiency would mean that you would find a way to convert that without any use of Mother Nature's activities. That's, of course, rubbish. So you have an upper bound to the efficiency. So if the numerator, total GDP, keeps on going up and up, your demand is, in the long run, would continue to be high. Okay, so next is, well, then you have a trade-off between numbers and standard of living. I mean, I keep on using the climate change examples simply because I wanted to show that you can't simply talk about improving the efficiency with which you use Mother Nature's goods and services. We need now to talk about the standard of living that we are willing to consider, as well as total numbers. If you think total numbers should not be discussed, then you better stop focused attention exclusively on the standard of living. Nobody's doing that, because the presumption is that it has to go up. Yes. All right, let's come to the second part of your question about this particular number that I constructed. So I asked the following question. Suppose we're in a world in which everybody receives the same amount of income, mm -hmm. and we choose a comfortable standard of living and ask ourselves what number and given the efficiency that we currently have of transforming Mother Nature's goods and services into final product, what number of human numbers would bring down the demand to the point where the ratio between demand and supply is one, not 1.7? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, how do I do that calculation? I used standard models of global production possibilities. There, I was completely orthodox. I used a model which is routinely used. It data onto that, calibrated the model using that data and asked the question, what would be the number with $20,000 PPP? as the average. And the answer that came up was about 3.2 billion. Now, I took into account the fact that not everybody who is alive actually works. So you have data on the proportion of people who work in today's world, and I just used those. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a completely illustrative example. Okay, I mean, we should be suspicious right from the start that the population figure I would get for 20,000 would be much lower than 8 billion. Mm -hmm. For the simple reason, at the moment, we are way above in our demand than sustainable supply. So something has to give. And I'm asking for an average which is higher than the one we actually have. 20,000 is higher than the per capita income in today's. So we shouldn't be surprised. But the other thing we shouldn't be surprised is that 3.2 billion or whatever. The exact number is not of interest at all. No. This is all very crude calculation. Of course. We're simply saying that it's much lower than it is currently. But we shouldn't be particularly worried about that fact because 3.2 billion was the number by 1960. 
60, 1960, 65. So we're not talking about an outlandish thing. It's just that we have had an extraordinarily good ride in the last 70 years. If you think that this last 70 years was the, the new normal, it's rubbish. It's for sure it's new, but it's not normal. It's a blip, a wink in economic history, the last right. 70 years. Yes. And the last 70 years is where we really hit the big time as a global community. Right. Okay, final point, Nandita, since you asked about there's inequality. So in suppose I were to introduce inequality, I'm afraid that the answer is worse. In my review, I asked the following question. We know that the richer the people are, the bigger their footprint, other things equal, say carbon emission or whatever. Mm -hmm. But from that, you shouldn't imagine that equality of distribution will reduce our footprint, because what matters is the marginal impact to an increase in footprint, to a marginal increase in income. And if that declines, then at the margin, a rich person has a footprint lower than a poorer person. At the margin, of course, his, his footprint is bigger. Mm -hmm. But if you give a dollar extra to a rich person, the additional footprint will be smaller than if you give a dollar to a poor person. Right. That turns out to be the case, by the way. So that means that if you introduce inequality, the population number would be even lower than 3.2 billion. Now, this is a cruel result, of course, cruel in the sense that I wish it weren't like that, but that's how it is. Right. So it just shows that you really have to be careful. It's not a political statement. We're doing some calculations using what data we have and using our common sense theorizing on these matters. I think something has to give. My own sense is that we have to worry, obviously, about the efficiency with which we translate Mother Nature's goods and services into final goods, and that can only be repaired by doing the kind of things that we've been discussing previously about putting prices, charging for the use of the oceans, and all the institutional errors which are making us misuse nature. That have to be corrected. So this is not an argument for saying, put all your money on population, I'm just simply saying that these factors are all related to one another. Yes. And mm -hmm. you can't simply concentrate on one or two and pretend the others on there. So that's why I've been very concerned about it. The less people talk about something, the more I tend to talk about it, because it seems mm -hmm. to me that's the only thing way to put some balance to it. So if I speak a lot on population, it's not because I think that's the thing to worry about, right? but it is something we can do something about. The other is, I think we just have to really take into account the fact that we need to reduce our footprint. Mm -hmm. And if that requires reduced consumption, we would reduce our consumption, of course, if we were pricing natural capital. Right. I mean, if, for example, we didn't spend five to six trillion dollars a year subsidizing agriculture. So yes. we would pay more for food, and so we would feel poorer. Mm -hmm. But it's the analogy I would like to make today, because it's sort of, I think it's more telling, is that imagine a chain of supermarkets which do not have an efficient sales counter so that you and I could go and lift stuff from it and take it home without paying. Let's say 90% of what we take, we don't pay for because they have such an imperfect monitoring system. Well, we'll feel pretty rich because we're getting this stuff free. But of course, they'll go bankrupt in due course, the chain. And that's effectively what happens. Then they say, no, we have got this system which allows us to charge you fully for what you're taking. Then, of course, we'll, we're no longer as rich as we thought we were because we're not stealing, we're not pilfering. But the analogy is exactly the same. Mother Nature doesn't have uh, checkout counters. So Yeah, and like you said uh, just now, is instead of pricing or fining for use of the service or overuse of these services, we're actually subsidizing nature destructive services, the fossil fuel industry or the agriculture industry. So it's the other way, you know, in terms of where the money is going. It's not even free. It's negative price. Exactly. And yeah, to your point, we're definitely very familiar with the troubling pattern on the progressive left, you know, represented by elites as well as international environmental conservation community to dismiss population concerns as valid. And it's really troubling because it's actually saddling people who already are deeply marginalized with more pressures that come from population-related issues. So it's not really helping anybody. So let me share some thoughts on this because it's something that has really bothered me quite a bit. I had about 300 plus events like the one here. It's organized by my team. I've got some sense of the distribution of ideas and the distribution of concerns across a very wide range of people. I mean, financiers, clerics, academics, NGOs, 
international organizations and so forth. So what I found is something to me is extremely sad as an academic, I guess, which is if I look at the elite, and I mean now the elites and the elite could be from anywhere. Okay, so it's we're looking at an international elite who are in governments, international organizations, NGOs, and they could be national, international banks, and they could be from anywhere. It could be from Africa, North America, Asia, or wherever. So they're not homogeneous in terms of origin yes. at all, or right. for that matter, gender. They could be women or men. But they speak uncannily in the same language, yes. the same grammar. And one of the things that are missing in the grammar is demography. Mm -hmm. Demographic issues are not on the table, as you were pointing out. And I've asked myself, how could such homogeneity of purpose, I mean, language, and of course it occurred to me, they're all going to the same school. They know each other. They've gone to, for postgraduate work, they've been to, you know, Kennedy School, maybe, <laughs> master's there, or, or a PhD at the London Business School or something, and they meet at meetings. And so it doesn't matter whether you're a professor in India or whether you're in England, or you meet at conferences and you have a similar outlook of deliberation. And in several of them, I've raised this issue and, and I didn't feel that there was any willingness to discuss it. I sort of felt that, look, it's the poor in society, the women, the mm -hmm. girls who do not have access to the means to exercise their basic rights. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment, everything is in terms of education. Now, it's too amorphous. It's too abstract kind of thing because it's easy to talk, but it's very hard to deliver. And as an educationist goes that saying, I like the idea of education, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult. It's not a question of simply putting up their schoolhouse. You need teachers who can teach. And there are wonderful examples of teachers who have no qualifications, hardly read and write. And then you need equipment and you need children to attend them. You need the teachers to attend. So there's a whole lot of things that come together. But in any case, this one is much more direct. Bangladesh is a very good example of a very, what we would have called 60 years ago, a traditional society. Yes. Conservative society, Islamic society. And look at where she has gone. Yeah. Compared Reduced to Pakistan, fertility. for example. Pakistan is just extremely interesting. And yes. she's doing very well economically, actually, mm -hmm. relatively speaking. And it's an extremely fragile topography. I mean, it's sort of floods and typhoons for the name of the day, you know. So how did that happen? There were lots of NGOs involved. And they engaged in participatory programs involving mm -hmm. the males, the village heads, and communities of women groups of women. Right. And the idea that people may be emboldened to say things, do things, if their neighbors say it and do it, that's rather alien to the Western concept of selfhood, which is mm -hmm. much more artistic. Mm -hmm. We don't like to think that we're influenced by others. But of course we are. I mean, look at our clothes that we wear and the food we eat. Yeah. Uh, those are banal to say that we are not social. But if you think that we are social, then we should take advantage of that. Mm -hmm to make people's lives better. So there's a whole host of issues that are connected not just with reproductive behavior, but with consumption patterns, investment patterns, lifestyle, the whole lot, which come together in one go. The reason I do speak a lot on population is, first of all, I like to think as an economist, I'm persuaded that reproductive behavior can be analyzed and understood in the same way as consumption behavior is, or dress behavior and so forth. And that the idea that when it comes to consumption, Tradition doesn't matter, but when it comes to reproduction, tradition matters and overrides it, and therefore you say it can't be discussed. That seems to me to be completely at variance with the data that I have, the evidence that I've acquired. Of. So I give it a little more time to talking about it as a reaction to the fact that nobody wants to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But it's not the case that I think it's the only thing to talk about. We need a structured way of thinking about our place in the biosphere, where we reside. We need to think in a constructive way about the ways in which collective decisions could be reached. Mm -hmm. And we have no way to do doing that. And if I may just make a quick comment, we are of the same belief. We need to be talking about everything, all of our patterns, consumption and population and how we treat one another and how we treat nature. And yet our podcast is called the Overpopulation Podcast, not because we think this is the only thing we need to be talking about, but like you, we feel this is the one area that is so taboo in culture to talk about that we almost need to 
make an overcorrection to that? Yes, there's that. And I, let me see, I could be a little bit more forceful on this because I think it's not for me to persuade anybody. It's for them to be persuaded if they wish to be or if they feel they are. But consider the following situation. My consumption pattern can be shown definitely as causing harm to somebody else. It would seem our societies are so constructed now that something will be done about it. And we see that, for example, we have prohibited smoking in public. Uh, that's a mutual harm. Of course, I realize that it's a sort of a reciprocal <laughs> external damage. You know, if I smoke, you're harmed, not me only. And if you smoke, you harm yourself and me and so forth. So that's probably why it's been easier to. Uh, right. Okay. And many other things. So now if we have this overshoot in our demand for Mother Nature's goods and services, then at the margin, an additional birth is going to contribute to that. That's right. And that's going to affect future people. Mm -hmm. They'll be inheriting a worse biosphere than otherwise would, at the margin, of course. Well, then why should we think that a couple's reproductive right today trumps the right of somebody in the future to inherit a less polluted earth or less damaged biosphere. It's not clear to me. Yeah. When it comes to consumption pattern, general behavior, we feel that we should take externalities into account and our law is so constructed as to reduce that externality. Yes. Right? But we don't do that here. And so, again, it's not for me to say what society should do. As an economist, all I can do is to produce evidence and a grammar with which to sift the evidence to see where it lands, how to see the world around us. That's my job. And I've tried to do it dare say honestly but many mm -hmm. others that's all i'm doing it's not for me to say what policies a country should take that's their business or society but there's a lot of shibboleths around yes and i can only look at parallel cases my daughter and i produced a series of papers she pointed out that the way you elicit the desire for the number of children you, know, mm -hmm. you have questionnaires how many children would you like to have or would you have wanted to have when you were you know 15 or <laughs> something like that and to me it's sort of fascinating because they relate to the fact that we have a preconception of the human person and these questions suggest that we are isolated, we are atomistic, we are solipsistic persons. Exactly. Solid. Mm -hmm. So we should be asking, how many would you have liked to have had if all your neighbors had two? Exactly. How many would you like to have if all your neighbors had three? And so yes. forth. It's very difficult to answer these questions, go without saying. Absolutely. But then on the other hand, we have to treat people with respect. So allow them to have feel that they, they can reason through. Yes. So it's interesting. I'm giving you these illustrations to see how far away from what I think a good integrated social science should be from mm -hmm. where it is today. And as I say, if I have been in these some of my meetings and in my writings, spending more time on some aspects of our behavior than others, it's to counterbalance. It's not that I'm obsessed with it. Okay. We don't think that at all. Well, thank you. Yeah, we appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> so you've been one of only a small number of economists that we know of to say that the pursuit of growth is going to be self-defeating. And you've also noted that formal economic models drive the policymaking of the future. Do you see any signs of greater acceptance in the economics profession as a whole for questioning the value of continuous economic growth? No, I don't see it. Mm. Not yet, anyway. I don't see it at all. Because there's a huge momentum. I'm a card-carrying economist. I'm very much an orthodox economist. There's nothing unorthodox about it at all. The tools I use are standard ones, so I've never had any problems. I'm not isolated by any stretch of imagination. I'm very much part of the, if you like, the elite of my profession, I guess, in some sense. A good contrast would be uh, one of the great minds of our in the social sciences is Robert Solo. You know, he's one of my gurus, one of the people I admire most. And also personal friend, but uh, he's 96, I think now. Hmm. And it was his model, which has triggered such a huge industry called growth economics, 1956, very famous paper. And he didn't have nature in it. He had capital, you know, physical capital, produce capital and labor producing output and so forth. It's a great piece of work, absolutely. But I've never criticized that paper because he was writing in the 50s. At that time, the global economy was relatively small. Right. It was a good first approximation not to have nature in it because that'll be another additional thing and then it'll be shown to be second order problem. So why not concentrate on this? And again, as I say, 1950, 56, not far off from the end of the war, you needed to reconstruct. So the focus was on building up infrastructure and factories and so forth and so on. That's perfectly okay. Now, 
if I talk to Robert Solo all through my life, he's always backed me up with all the moves I've made over my career. Today, even now when we correspond, he's actually written a very lovely piece to go with the published version of my review, the Descriptor Review. It's coming out from Cambridge University Press because he's moving with the team now. He is an empirically oriented economist. He's seen that now it's no longer second order. It's now first order problem mm. and it ought to be included. He's not going to do it himself. But if you ask him, he'll say, well, read the Descriptor. We read one of the chapters of it. And that's how I see social science at its best, that you move with the evidence and then try and modify the models, but you know, with the same rigor. And in my review, I have tried to construct such a model. It's very early days yet because I haven't estimated, but the idea was to use ecology very carefully and all the things that Nandita and you have been mentioning about our embeddedness. When we say that we're embedded in nature and so forth, I mean, it looks like sort of a metaphor. It's sort of cozy, it's nice, warm feeling, and it's all that. But of course, it has a hard edge to it. Mm -hmm. You have to model that formally into the production structure. And I've tried to do that. Maybe people find better ways of doing it, but you have to kick off by not simply using that as a metaphor and then ignoring it when you actually write down a formal model on the basis of which you discuss growth possibilities. You were asking me, has it happened? And I answered, no. And why hasn't it happened? I think the reason is that economists don't read ecology. That's as simple as that. Right. Our intellectual background is from math, stats, physics maybe, but not ecology, which is surprising because ecology is very similar to economics in the way it studies, because they're looking at populations of uh, organisms and the systems that are constructed out mm -hmm. of their behavior. The system, the architecture of, of ecosystems is constructed out of these interactions of various populations of organisms, as well as, of course, the inorganic material that's around, minerals and so forth. So I think if they did, it, it does require some investment. It goes on saying, you know, when you sort of wake up next morning and say, well, I now know ecology, I'm, I've got the sensitivity. But we don't have that kind of training at all. And the more environmental and resource economists have isolated themselves or got isolated from mainstream economics, the more this different divergence has taken place. There are plenty of people who understand what my review is about and mm -hmm. on what we've been discussing. But they are not in economics departments. They are in ag econ departments in the United States, schools of the environment. There are plenty of very good people there. The School of Forestry at Yale, the School of Environment at Duke, the ag econ department at Berkeley have first rate people. Mm -hmm. But none of them is actually in the economics department of there. And that's, I think, very unfortunate because it really is unfortunate because there is a sense in which environmental and resource economics is a sort of an outlier. In fairness, until very recently, environmental and resource economists deserve to be outliers because they were looking at a very small piece. They saw Mother Nature as being a source of resources, provisioning goods. Okay, so fossil fuel industry, study of that, that class of issue, exhaustible resources, something I, I myself was involved in in the 70s uh, with some colleagues. In, but we were concentrating on provisioning goods. And as I said, the what I've learned from ecology is to transfer my attention to maintenance and regulating services, because that's where the action is, because that's the mother of all things. And we've been dancing around this. We haven't actually come out and said it, but you wrote the Biodiversity Review, and it's essentially carries your name. It's called the Das Gupta Review, and it was commissioned by the UK Treasury. And it reflects really well on your ability, as I've said already, to make two seemingly incongruent pathways, the economy and nature, to come together in such a high-level document. And it's clearly starting to enter policy discussions from what we've looked at in your other interviews. First of all, how did you manage to get such an impressive high-level government sponsorship for this work? I have no idea. I was just called up at the principal secretary of the treasury hmm. one day sometime in 2019 and asked whether I would be willing to do this. And almost immediately I said, yes, sure, this will be my kind of stuff. And the finance minister announced that same afternoon in parliament that I think they suspected I would say yes. And they gave me a wonderful team to work with. So you're right. There is a puzzle there. It is a puzzle. At least it's an interesting that it's the finance ministry, right. the treasury, which commissioned such a non-treasury subject, so to speak. But they sponsored the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change in 2006, I guess it came out, or 2007. So they have a tradition of doing this, although with two is a tradition. <laughs> but 
It is true. The economics of climate change produced for the Treasury was very much in line with Treasury's view of the economy in the sense that they were looking at a technological solution to a problem which mm. is manifest itself as an environmental problem. And the technological solution is to move towards clean energy, bringing about an industrial change to solar, wind, and so forth. Okay, But otherwise, you can have GDP growth. And Alan was asking previously, right. can you have that indefinitely? And what my review, I like to think pretty convincingly shows is that no, you can't. You can't have indefinite growth in final output because it's a bounded biosphere we happen to inhabit. And there is no way in which we can eventually become external to the biosphere. Mm -hmm. If somebody says you can have indefinite growth, then you're taking the position that we can escape the biosphere. I don't mean physically, but that working within the biosphere, we can detach ourselves because we've become so much clever in finding ways of transforming another nature's goods and services into our lifestyle. That is not possible. That simply right. is not possible. If we literally cannot escape the biosphere. We're part of nature. And that means we can't have indefinite growth. And we have to come to that terms and then see how to maneuver ourselves in such a way that we can comfortably exist where we are. And all of what we've been discussing is a way of talking about. And more than that, we've got quantitative models and policies that we need to put in place, whether at the local level, regional level, national level, global level, depending on the problem at hand. But they're all related to one another in a way that can be quantified, in a way that can be articulated precisely, or as precisely as is possible in the social and ecological sciences. But we are nowhere near to doing that. So although the Treasury sponsored it, and they have been extremely generous with their attention because the review was submitted in early February 2021, and then a small part of my team remained for another 10 months for dissemination purposes. Now, that cost money. The Treasury also came up with a response to the review within two months, I think, and it's on their website. It's a very substantial response, about 20 pages long, and it's all very favorable, including a passage on population, by the way. So yes, they have been very, very good. And other departments of the government have been very interested in it and I'm having meetings with them. DEFRA, for example, which is the environmental department of the government, they want to relate to the Treasury and the Foreign Office because the Foreign Office now includes not the Commonwealth and development. So it's an integrated office. Mm. And I'm having quite a bit to do with them as well. Now, that doesn't mean that they're carrying out things largely because there are many things they can't carry out. You know, it's a one country out of it. But there are some things that they can do. Measuring, for example, introducing biodiversity as a criterion right. in the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. My wife told me that she thought that was the most important thing they've done because they said, well, look, we're in a democratic society. If it's there, then somebody can say, you made this decision. How does it affect biodiversity? Because you're mandated to take biodiversity into account when you make public decisions. Right. And she's right. And they did do that. Biodiversity is not part of the language. Now, that doesn't mean that they would be doing much with it, by the way. And in fact, the most recent announcement of the government has been that they would relax the environmental laws in order to generate growth. So we'll see. Yeah, no, that's very heartening, actually. I mean, who knows how long it'll take before these kinds of policies are implemented, but even normalizing, talking about biodiversity as a subset of economics and bringing population to the conversation is a really big step. And we spent so much uh, resources probably measuring GDP more and more accurately, but we've spent so little yeah. attention and resources. I think I've heard you mention on a podcast even general qualitative statements like this peatland is unhealthy or would be much better than what we're doing now, which is exactly. nothing. That's exactly right. And um, I think we should stop pretending that we can quantify everything. Qualitative statements are extremely important. The medical profession lives on qualitative statements. Now, I know they like to back it up, you know, blood count and so forth. But on the whole, they'll start by saying, look, you look a bit unhealthy. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and the fear of the Lord. So the government's latest two, three days ago, the idea of relaxing some of the environmental laws uh, to promote growth has created, of course, huge worries amongst environmental NGOs. And there is a good deal of writings going on about how without a sound ecology, I mean, an environment, you know, it affects growth. There's tr truth in all that, but it's not the one which I would use, partly because in a way it's already defensive. You're saying, well, of course, we all love growth, but growth of GDP, that is. And, 
And you're wrong in thinking that we don't need nature for that. I think I wouldn't use that, personally not for England. And here is why. I think we can destroy quite a bit more of nature in England without affecting our GDP. Mm. We can do that because we've been trashing nature for millennia. In fact, the world has been trashing nature for millennia. So what's happened with England in particular, the advanced countries, is that they have outsourced their biodiversity needs. That's what we've been doing. Yes. It's not our biodiversity which creates our high income. It's that we are actually using somebody else's biodiversity and we're trashing that. We're outsourcing it. For example, the newspaper, the Economist had a very interesting but really rather wrong-headed headline. The main story was that the picture on the cover of a bulldozer which has been shackled, you know, strung up so that the bulldozer can't operate. And the lead article was unshackle the bulldozer because the environmental laws are so pernicious now that people can't build a factory at a particular place or in this case 290 apartments because there is a unity of bats in that particular location. Now, when I read that, I realized, of course, that there is a sense in which at that at the margin, it is ridiculous. It sounds very ridiculous because there's 290 apartments that could be constructed of that. And of course, there are other bad populations. But then the right way to think about it, in my judgment, is that, of course, that's the argument that's been used over and over again for millennia, leading to where we are today. And so it's not that preservation of the bats are necessary for our well-being at the margin here with the 219 apartments. But we have been actually trashing the bat populations elsewhere. I'm using that as a metaphor for nature. So that's where the difficulties arise. That is, we shouldn't always be on the defensive. NGOs should not be on the defensive and pretend that all hell will break loose if another thousand acres of land in a reasonably pristine sort of area in England is trashed and made into shopping malls and so forth. It'll continue, but we need to see where we can do that at the expense of what elsewhere in the world, and we're not paying for it. Because if we have paid for the biodiversity we are trashing elsewhere, then of course we wouldn't be in the problem. We're not paying. That's why we're overusing the biodiversity of Africa when we import cocoa, coffee beans, so forth. Okay. Yeah. So as I say, I'm giving these illustrations of how it is not difficult to integrate spatially, temporarily, and across communities, our activities and the implications they have. We need to lift ourselves above our self-interest when we discuss these things. Of course, when you go to the supermarket, it should be self-interest. You go there, you need to know what you'd like to have, and you've got your money. You pay for it. But in these issues where there's so much of institutional failure, we can't be thinking only in self-interest because at the end of the day, we collectively ruin ourselves. Like the tragedy of the commons is a metaphor for our acting in our self-interest and all hell breaks loose. Right. We solve many collective action problems, traffic signals and uh, airline routes and so forth. I mean, the whole world depends on these collective actions, but yes. we haven't managed it when it comes to these regulating and maintenance services. And I keep on banging on about them because they're the ones which get overlooked. We yes. keep on thinking about vanishing forests or water supply and so forth, but the, the epiphenomena, the phenomenon is down under, as it were. And I think the thing on Mother Nature is, at least in an urban society, we really need to operate at the local level. We can do a lot to improve our lives. And it seems to me that the more you get engaged in local issues, environmental issues, then your mind gives attention to these problems and you lift these problems away from the local to the regional and global. And the work of people like Robert Putnam on social capital has made it abundantly clear how valuable local engagement is for many other things, not just local ones, but you get to know people, you discuss, you get ideas, you then get exercised about something which is beyond your community. Right. And you do something about it and you get in touch with somebody else in another community and, and so forth. So it seems to me that may be one way we can be operationally engaged as opposed to simply thinking about it and talking about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Building up greater trust, that would help. And we certainly have a lack of that in a lot of countries, including the U.S. And that I've heard some research cooperation begets cooperation. It's like a muscle that you need to use. And um, using it at the local level, community level, would build up what I think a lot of us have lost when we rely on the impersonal market and the impersonal state, all those yeah. intermediate institutions and organizations and networks. Yeah, that's right. 
Thank you. Yeah, that was very helpful. Great illustrations there. Thank you so much for <laughs> such a wonderful interview. I definitely felt like I was sitting in a classroom. So much to learn. <laughs> it was Thank a you. very good yeah. chat with you today. Thank you so much, Sir Partha, for joining us. Thank you. Well, that's it for this edition of the Overpopulation Podcast. Visit populationbalance.org to learn more. And to share feedback or guest recommendations, write to us using the contact form on our site or by emailing us at podcast at populationbalance.org. If you feel inspired by our work, please consider supporting us using the donate button. Also, to help expand our listenership, please consider rating us on whichever podcast platform you use. Until next time, I'm Nandita Bajaj, thanking you for your interest in our work and for all of your efforts in helping us all shrink toward abundance. 